All right. There it goes, Joe. How you doing, buddy? Uh, doing great. Looking forward to another Cloudy County. Yeah, me too. So my name is Dwayne. This is Joe. We are a couple of computer nerds from the University of Florida who support Extension down here in the sweet, sweet heat of, uh, of Florida. I feel like it's, what's the heat index, Joe? Like 100 and million? <laughs> Especially in my house right now. With uh, I had a lightning strike uh, almost coming up on two weeks ago and still waiting for AC parts. So it's a little toasty. Yeah, that's no good. Um, well, Joe, we got to travel a little bit uh, a few weeks ago. We got to head up north. <laughs> for for us here in Florida, everything is north. Uh, and we got to go up to Arkansas and uh, discovered that the climate in Arkansas is exactly the same as, as Florida. It was hot and muggy. Um, not quite as humid, but still pretty dang hot. <laughs> so, nice time up in Little Rock, though. Yeah. Yeah, we got to go to the uh, National Extension Technology Community Conference, which was great. It was uh, the first time that that community's met in a couple of years for, for obvious reasons, like everybody else. Um, it was a good time. We got to see some Extension colleagues. I see a couple of names on here uh, that were at that conference, so that was a great time. And um, it's just really nice. Extension IT is such a special <laughs> unique unique thing uh and it's really it's really cool to to see other other it uh people who are also supporting extension um so shout out to to that community that was a good time yeah we definitely learned uh, uh it was my first time at, at that conference definitely learned about the number of ways that extension programs across the country are architected and the hierarchy uh is pretty amazing yeah yeah, it's uh, it seems that every state has a different um, configuration for how like where extension falls in their land grant university. Uh, here in Florida, we're very connected to the whole university. Uh, in Arkansas, they were actually a completely separate set thing. Like everything was separate. It was pretty pretty wild. Um, and yeah, and we heard from other schools that how they were set up and it was uh definitely <laughs> definitely different um also coming up soon uh really soon next week so if we've got anybody who is a member of the national association of county agricultural agents uh their professional improvement conference is going to be next week in palm beach florida and joe and i will be there i had posted an, an announcement about this but uh come see us we have like a lot of stickers there's a whole box next to me of stickers uh so if you want a sticker come come see us if you're into stickers that's like a good com i don't know if that's like a nerdy conference thing or if normal conferences do stickers but i know at nerd conferences like microsoft ignite and stuff like that uh stickers are kind of a kind of a big deal uh <laughs> so we'll we're see gonna if you introduce can make stickers into agriculture i think <laughs> Sorry, Joe. What was that? I'll see, we'll try to make it a big deal at NACA. So definitely, <laughs> definitely. All right. Well, let's get into our uh, our normal flow. For those of you who might be new, the way that we like to do these calls is uh, we start off with uh, what's new. So Teams is constantly changing. An evergreen service always keeps you on your toes. There's always something new uh, that's come out that that we want to tell you about. You know and it's sometimes it's a big deal, you know, like a brand new feature. And sometimes it's they just moved a button around. But we want to make sure everybody is aware of some of the things that are new. And then we'll get into our feature highlight, which I'm really excited about this month's highlight, because this is a like mark my words. This is a big deal. Uh, we're going to be talking about Microsoft Teams shared channels. Uh, they are scheduled to be fully released in days like they said the middle of July. Uh, so if Microsoft holds true to that in a couple of days, you should be seeing some new stuff uh, in your Teams app and shared channels are going to change the way people work together. You know, it's 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 a big deal. And uh, and then we'll turn the recording off and we'll uh, do some Q&A and just hang out and chat. So, Joe, you want to start us off with some some new stuff? Sure. Let me uh, get a share going here. Going to cover three new items that are starting to show up. Um, 
hopefully they get rolled out and finished rolled out here this month or so. We are seeing now something that we've been waiting around for a good year. What do you think, Dwayne, for um, the ability to <laughs> rename a channel and actually have the backend storage also update? So up until very recently, if you wanted to change a name of, of a channel, easily come in and you can uh, edit the channel. You can change this name out. But if you did that, the backend storage wouldn't change. So this, we're talking about backend storage, where your files live is, is SharePoint. So back in uh, every team, you get a SharePoint document library. And every channel that gets created, every standard channel gets created, it will produce a folder in there. And there's, you can go in sometimes into this SharePoint world, and sometimes there's reasons to go in here, um, maybe around permissioning or recovery of files. Typically, you don't have to go in here, but if you do, it could be confusing. You would end up with a, a, a channel that's been renamed, but not its corresponding folder in the SharePoint library. So now, thankfully, that has been corrected. So if I update this, let's go to project four. If I go into files for this channel, I now see project four is listed here. And if we go into the back end of the SharePoint site, we also have that renamed. Um, anything that you've renamed previously aren't going to automatically update to the new name. Um, so maybe, you know, if you did really want to fix that, you might uh, give that folder a new name. Um, you know, sometimes you put a space in there, or put another number or something like that, but it's not going to go back in time and, and updates, update those on us. But going forward, uh, that should stay in, in shape. And I believe if you've made a, a shortcut to that in your OneDrive, that's going to get updated all the way through also. So that should stay a little, li a little less uh, troublesome trying to figure out what you're looking at. We've Next seen item. some really old yeah, school channels. Sorry, that, that, that yeah. you know, Older teams that the channel has been around for a really long time. And when they first created the team, you know, they named the channel social media. And then they decided several months later, a year later, whatever, you know, uh, the scope of this channel has changed a little bit. We're just going to call it marketing. Well, forever, the folder always remained social media. And it would really confuse people uh, as to like, am I in the right place? Am I working on the right stuff? So it makes a lot more sense to have this in sync now uh, so that it, you, you know you're working in the right folder and that folder matches the channel that you think it does. The next item we're going to cover is something that is called join a meeting with an ID now. So that's something that I think pretty, pretty common people have been used to in Zoom. Um, not really been... I don't know, it's not been that uh, popular, necessary. We haven't really seen the need in Teams, the way that we work with Teams, but now there's ability to join with an ID in, in Teams. So if you um, gonna open up an existing calendar item, and in part of the invite code area, we now see a meeting ID and a passcode. So this is information that you could provide to someone. Um, you know, typically we're given a link out or something like that. Um, maybe there's a need to do this over a traditional landline uh, phone call, someone to bring in someone and get them into your meeting. Trying to think of the scenarios in which that might be used. That's probably the, one of the ones that we kind of come up with. Um, but you can get that meeting ID and that passcode and give that to someone. And in their calendar, in Teams, go back just to the calendar, you're going to start seeing a join with an ID option. And that's where you can put that meeting ID in and you can put in that meeting passcode. There's also a way to do this through a website. And, and this might be another scenario where you pass someone a this website and a meeting ID and a passcode. I uh, will drop this in, in the chat. Um, but this is a way to also join and get access to that meeting. So just another way to get in there. Um, 
be curious to see what your thoughts are on um, you know, how you might take advantage of that. The next item we're going to look at is something that uh, we've been asking for also for a while that Teams has finally brought out, and that is co-organizer for uh, a meeting. But typically, the organizer has the ability to set some meeting options, and that was the only person who could set those. We're not going to dive into meetings too much. We're going to plan that out um, later uh, for some other Cloudy County sessions. But if you are using Teams now or used to that, this is something to, to look out for now that, that hopefully is showing up for you. But if I generate a new meeting, um, test meeting, and add in a, I need to add some type of uh, attendee. So I'm going to add Dwayne from my tenant, and I'm going to generate this meeting. And we're going to go into the meeting options. And this is where you would typically enable or disable microphone, um, things like that. So we're going to go in and, and jump into these, these meeting options. And that's going to kick you out to a web browser. And something now that we should see is this co-organizers right here. Now I can search for this from the people that I've added to my, uh, as, a, as an attendee. So there's Dwayne. He's now a co-organizer. And typically in this case, that might be something else you would do is maybe come in here and decide who can present. So that's another uh, typical option you might set in a, a you know a scheduled meeting. Um, so now your organizer and the person who you've, you've you know, scheduled to also be an attendee can be prepared when that meeting starts up to take basically full control of, of that meeting. Typically, you could create uh, and set up an, a presenter uh, beforehand and presenters, if you have that option versus an attendee, presenters can manage the microphone and the cameras um, and uh, manage chat and things like that. This, um, what do you think, Dwayne? We, it's, it's a nice new feature, but not that, not that helpful yet. <laughs> I think um, the the place where I see this being useful is when you have a couple of agents or educators that are maybe perhaps doing a webinar uh, or uh, a larger event that's maybe public. You can have a second set of eyes look at this meeting options page. And prior to co-organizer, the only person who could look at the meeting options page was the person who scheduled the event, the, the meeting. And so I, I see some use there where you can have some confirmation, you know, have a couple people check and say, okay, we don't want cameras turned on. Let me double check and make sure that nobody can use their camera. You know, you have that option now. As far as what other kind of controls does it give you in a Teams meeting? Not super useful because presenters, like you said, have a lot of control as it is. They can, uh, a fellow presenter can mute and unmute other people's microphones. A fellow presenter can promote another person from attendee to presenter and then demote them back down to attendee. You know, we've had that with larger meetings where we had numerous people giving presentations in sequence. You know, we had a, I see the word co-pilot there in the, um, in the chat. So we've had a facilitator or a co-pilot who is looking at the schedule and they promote the next presenter. That person shares their screen or does a PowerPoint live. Then they demote them and then they grab the next one. So so all that stuff was already possible uh, in teams. And so, yeah, I, I think I think we said before they added a lot of fluff to this announcement and made co-organizer like a big deal when it really the only thing it does is it allows another person to double check that the options for the meeting are set correctly, which is is useful, but it's not like revolutionary, I guess. Yeah, I think the the one about um having a large meeting with multiple people trying to and trying to manage that uh sometimes we've used a service account previously where both of us could go in and, and update that now we don't need to go that route um to update these these uh options i see a question in the chat about can you add a co-host to existing meetings um i i guess the word co-host to me is is a is a zoom term that I feel like doesn't necessarily have a, a parallel over in Teams world because of the because of the power that a presenter really has on a call. 
uh, it doesn't take but two clicks to make somebody who's already in a meeting into a presenter. And so if you if you look at the people button in this call that we're on right now, you'll see that Joe and I are up at the top in the presenters section and then everyone else below is an attendee. So you can't like share your screen over top of us or whatever. We could mute you if we needed to, those types of things. Um, so there's not really a co-host per se in Teams like there is in Zoom, but this co-organizer, again, really just makes sure that you can double check these options because as we not to get too off the rails, but as we go later on in this cloudy county teams fundamental series, we'll talk about meetings, but the the meeting options is really where you you cover yourself when it comes to like meeting security. This is where you make sure that the right people have the right access. And if it's a public call, you turn off, you know, their cameras and, and their microphones and stuff like that, and make it more of a of a webinar. Um, type function. So, but we'll we'll get there. <laughs> and you were able to go back uh, to an existing meeting that this had showed up for and add that option. We didn't have yes. to. Yeah. So if you don't see this option yet, remember Microsoft rolls these things out slowly. They've got a few billion, you know, endpoints that they have to update. And so if you don't see it yet, you probably will see it soon. Um, and you'll be able to go back to a existing scheduled meeting and update. Um, now, remember what Joe said, though, in order to define a person as a co-organizer, they have to be on the direct invite. They have to be on the two line for the meeting. Otherwise, you won't be able to pick their name. So that's the scope of who you can choose from. All right, let's uh, let's get into the meat and meat and potatoes of today's call. We're going to talk about uh, shared channels. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, prior to doing that, let's have some fun though. I am going to pop up a poll on everybody's screen, maybe. And uh, did you know that you can do this? So that was a what's new that um, we didn't really cover, but polls have been in uh, Teams for a really long time. And uh, and now you can, yeah, I like that. Somebody just wrote hot. <laughs> what is the temperature here, Joe? It is, uh, according to my phone, it is currently 95. So jealous I'm seeing some like 83s in there. Goodness. Uh, so this is a lot of fun. This is just something to keep everybody awake. Uh, you can throw a word poll cloud, uh, word, word cloud poll. Sorry, I mangled that uh, right into a meeting. It's a lot of fun. Uh, let me get my screen share going. If they're not, not paying attention, we're going to put a quiz up there, right? We can do quizzes <laughs> there too. So. Yeah, there's quizzes now. That's right. Yeah, that, that's pretty funny. I, I, we'll definitely cover Microsoft Forms again in, in, in another uh another call, but it is going to be um, like somebody uh, it has to be Dominic. Just put it's Arizona. That's how hot it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So I'm going to get uh, get started here. So last month we talked about um, we talked about channels. We that was the whole topic of last month's call was talking about channels. And we said to you that channels are where the work gets done. Channels is where the action is at inside of teams. And channels is the way that you organize your work streams. It's the way that you organize conversation and content inside of an existing team. Channels are incredibly useful. They are like the core of collaboration inside of a team. Now, we talked about two different types of channels. We talked about a standard channel, which would be a channel kind of like uh, Cloudy Chat in the Cloudy County Extension team. This is a channel that is available to every single person who is a member of this team. This is how, this is how Teams was born. It came this way straight from the get-go. Every single channel was a standard channel visible to all team members. That kind of threw people off at first, and they got a little, I don't know, uh uncomfortable thinking well every single person i add has access to every single thing in my team you know i don't know if i want that and we would remind people well it's teams you know this is your team <laughs> the idea is you work with a team of people you trust those people because they're your team but we started to realize, especially in, in academia, that, you know, that's not how the real world works. And so Microsoft came out with a, a new type of channel that's indicated here with this little lock icon. And this was called a private channel. 
a private channel would allow you to create a super secret place that you could manage the membership of that channel and you could add specific people into that channel and that channel will only show up for the people that you added. This is useful. It has its limitations. Like you can't, um, for instance, if we go back in here, I can't add a uh, planner, Microsoft planner, which again, we haven't talked about, but it's project management. We did cover it in the first meeting of office 365 overview planner is great. It's super, super useful for managing small projects, but it doesn't work in a private channel. Uh, the other thing that you can't do is you can't schedule a meeting. So if I go over to my meetings channel next to meetings, I can drop this down and I can schedule a meeting in the future, a recurring meeting, you know, anything like that. Again, we haven't talked about meetings and teams, but channel meetings are an incredibly useful, powerful part of Microsoft Teams. So you don't get that in a private channel. You can start a ad hoc instant meeting, but that won't drop it on everybody's calendar. So those two things make private channels. You have to understand the limitations there. You can use a private channel inside of a team and have a great place to have private conversation and private file storage. One of the things about private channels that we realized after they'd been in use for a little while that again, made people uncomfortable was I want to be able to add somebody to this private channel, but you're telling me that I have to add them to the team first. And that's the, that is true. The scope of who you can choose in a private channel is somebody who has to be a member of, so let me type in Pike. So captain Christopher Pike of the USS enterprise cannot be added into this private channel because he is not a member of my team. However, Joe, I believe is, oh, maybe not. Maybe I don't have anybody in here. I don't know who I've added to this. Well, let's, let's try it now. So we'll add, um, we'll go ahead and add Pike. And if nobody's noticed, we have a heavy Star Trek theme for just about everything we do because we are nerds. Uh, so now I should be able to add Pike. So I couldn't add him before, now I can, so now he'll have access to my private channel, but guess what? Now he also has access to every standard channel. Because remember how we started this conversation. Standard channels are visible to every single person who's in the team. So that threw people off a little bit. They wanted to bring somebody in just for the sake of being a member of a super secret project channel that was a that was a part of an established team that they already had but they didn't want to grant them access to everything else well now there is a way to do that this is probably the biggest deal when it comes to channels ever is there is a new type of channel called a shared channel and notice the icon difference there there's a padlock next to a private channel and now there's this like, uh, what would you call that, Joe? Like a chain link? Looks like a something. couple links. Yep. Little infinity symbol <laughs> going on there. Um, so now we'll have the option to create a shared channel. A shared channel, I think the best way that we found to summarize what a shared channel is, is if you've seen the movie Inception, it's like that. Or more, <laughs> more uh, aptly, it to. is a team inside of a team. It is a place where you can create a team workspace and you can nest it inside of an established team that you already have. Uh, crazy. Well, we're going to go through it and I'll show you how it works. So when you click the three dots uh, as a team owner, when you click on the three dots on a team, uh, we also call that the meatball menu, and you go to add a channel, you're going to have the ability to Drop this down and you have some options here. The default is a standard channel and Microsoft's doing a pretty good job here of straight up telling you exactly what's going to happen. Everyone on the team has access. You can create your private channel. Specific teammates will have access. Then you can create the new shared channel. People you choose from your org, meaning your school, whoever's inside of teams at your school or other orgs, which we're going to put an asterisk next to that and, uh, and kind of put a pin in it, and we'll talk about it in a minute, uh, but ignore that for right now. So I'm going to create a shared channel, and the shared channel that I'm going to make is going to be um, 
I don't know, the uh, NX project. And uh, by default, it's going to share this channel with every single person who is already in my team. So this would kind of make it act as if it were a standard channel, right? Because remember, standard channels are available to all team members. You do have the ability to uncheck this, though. Like if you wanted to treat this with more fine grain control, like maybe there's 100 people in this team and not all 100 people need access to this. You could dial this down a little bit. So I will go ahead and do that and uncheck share this with everybody on my team. So I'll click uh, create. And it says adding the channel. Really what's happening behind the scenes is it's doing so much more than that. It's basically, like I said, spinning up a whole nother team and burying it inside of my existing Dwayne's test team. Now, just like when you create a team, it's asking you, do you want to start adding people? And right out of the gate, it want, it's promoting you to start dropping people in. And we always say, skip this. We said, we said this when we did our very first session on teams for this community was, we have this principle that we like to live by called purpose before people. Create your team, get your team set up the way you want it set up, get your channels built the way that you want your channels built, put a welcome message in the general channel, set all your security settings and then start adding people it's you know we used a house analogy when we talked about channels and the, the idea is do you want to invite everybody into a house while you're in the middle of building it while you're in the middle of decorating it no you want to get it set up first and then invite people in for the party right so i'm going to click skip and invite nobody so now i have a completely it's kind of like a private channel. Like nobody can see this except me. I'm the only member of this NX project channel. So this is where the amazing secret sauce of shared channels starts to happen. If I go look at my team and I look at my members, I've got myself, I've got Joe, I've got uh, Captain Pike that I just added. I've got a guest account. I'm going to add another starship captain to this channel who is not a member of this team so we'll go here you get a new option share with or share channel and you have three options here when you do the manage this channel option you have share with a specific person share with another team which is a really cool use case we'll get into and share with another team that you own so I might be a member of 100 teams and maybe I want this channel to be in multiple teams. We'll be able to do that. Let's start with something simple though, a basic use case of share this with another person. So share with people. I'm gonna type in the name of a very famous guy here, Captain Jean-Luc Picard, and I'm gonna share it with him. And so I have options here, just like again, think of this like a team inside of a team, I can make Captain Picard an owner of my shared channel so that he could add other people. That's the primary difference between a team member and a team owner is owners can add other people. Members cannot. Uh, he would also have the ability to go in and manage a few settings that are uh, available in the channel. But for right now, I'm just going to leave him as a as a member. We can poke at those settings real quick. Um, so if I go to NX project, Go to uh, manage channel and look at the settings. You can see there's a very limited subset of um, member permissions in here versus what would be in a full blown team, because this is like, again, it's like a little tiny team inside of a team and only has one channel. So there's not a there's not going to be an option to prevent members from creating channels like there would be in regular teams because this only is restricted to the single channel. But you do have the ability to prevent members from updating tabs. Uh, maybe you want to streamline that process or control that process a little bit better. So you can turn that off and on. So let's take a look and see what happened on Captain Picard's side. Because this is Dwayne's side, and that's fine and great. But what happened to Captain Picard? So Captain Picard, I'm looking at his team's environment now. He got a message that said, Dwayne shared a channel with you, an X project. And so where does that show up? Uh, well, it looks like I already had my team here, so I'm going to 
showed in my list. And I am now looking at Dwayne's test team as captain for card, and I only see one singular channel. We know that there's more channels because if I flip back over to Dwayne's view, let me uh, shrink all this other stuff. We can see general and scanning and meanings and stuff like that. But Captain Picard has no visibility into all those other things that are going on inside of that team. I feel like what just happened here in a couple of clicks, Joe and I have joked, we could just go ahead, wipe our hands and be like, it's done. That's amazing. Look at that. That's what people have wanted. That's what people have wanted since teams came out. <laughs> they wanted the ability to pick and choose who had access to stuff in their team without having to go through a bunch of hoops. So shared channels is giving us that right away. And I feel like that's, it's pretty amazing. So um, let me, let me go back over. I'll add uh, Joe. I didn't add you to NX project. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I used it as an opportunity to, in the chat to kind of show what my view looked like. Um, as a okay, member of that perfect. team, I didn't see that channel uh, after you created it because you didn't, you didn't immediately share it with the current members of the team. Correct. Yeah. So let me go ahead and add you. Um, and we'll see. I mean, just to, you know, kind of put the proof in the pudding. Um, uh, let's go. Let's go to warp 10, which Star Trek land isn't even thing, is it? Uh, <laughs> and if we go over, Captain Picard can see that conversation. He can react to it. He can reply. And uh, and that's great. So it's like a little tiny team inside of a team. I keep I just really want to drive that point home of what these things really are. Now, there is separate file storage happening. So this shared channel has its own dedicated file storage. Joe talked early on in this um, about uh, the what's happening in SharePoint kind of behind the scenes when you rename a channel and how it renames the storage and the corresponding SharePoint site. Well, what happens when you create a shared channel? Let me flip back over here. We look at files. And we have this open in SharePoint button. If I click open in SharePoint, this is a completely separate, dedicated SharePoint site just for this channel it is completely disconnected from the team that it belongs to there's no relationship there other than the fact that um it shows up that way in teams you can kind of tell uh in the address bar here I zoom in you can see right there it says Dwayne's test team dash index project so if you were trying to track down where did this thing come from because now we have this really oddball channel that can show up in multiple places to multiple people. It could be difficult to figure out where it came from. It will be in the address of the SharePoint website. That's the, I think, probably the best way that we've found so far to figure out where these things come from. Uh, but I see a file has been dropped in there. Um, Captain Picard has access to that file. Whoops, this is Captain Picard. Uh, he has access to that file, and I have access to that file. We could all start working together uh, just like any other team. I think this is, again, like I said, this is the amazing part of shared channels is the ability to selectively bring in individuals into a team or into a channel without adding them to the team. That's what people have wanted. It took five or six years to, <laughs> to, to get it, uh, but it's here. Maybe it's supposed to be here this month. <laughs> So let's talk about a few of the other different ways that you could share a channel, because this is where things are going to really start to get um, a little a little bit weird. You can take a channel. If we go back to NX project and we share, you can share this channel with another team entirely. And so when we look at Captain Picard and his list of teams, he's got a team, you know, USS Enterprise. Well, if I flip back over to my view, I can say, I want to share this channel and I want to share it with another team. Maybe we're collaborating. Maybe this is a core project that spans multiple groups inside of your university. People out there already have teams created. We've got in Florida, our extension program has five districts. We've carved up the state into five districts. Well, there's it's not uncommon for there to be something that 
is happening in all five of those districts at the same time. So rather than creating another team completely dedicated to whatever that one singular project is, we could create a channel for that project and push it to those five district, excuse me, district level teams. So I'm going to type in the name of Captain Jean-Luc Picard because I know that he owns the team that I ultimately want this channel to be shared to. I know that I want the NX project channel to be a part of the enterprise team that he owns. So I'm going to send the invite. And there's an interesting little um, negotiation, <laughs> we'll call it, a little dance that has to happen right here. So I'm going to click OK. Let me take a look at Jean-Luc Picard's side of the equation here. Again, my activity feed lights up and it says, you have a shared, this looks a little different. This is not just like a notification. Hey, you've been added to something. This is requesting me to do something. So I know that the NX project channel has been shared with me by Dwayne. I have 14 days to figure out if I want it or not. So I could totally say, no, nah, it's not. I, you, you, you send that to the wrong person. That's not for me. I could decline it. In this case, I will accept. Now, I have to add this channel to a team that I own. So in this case, Jean-Luc Picard only owns one team, and that's the Enterprise D. So I can select Enterprise D and say done. Now that's not the end of the story. Let's say Jean-Luc Picard owned 100 teams. I could have picked the wrong one. Like maybe, maybe him and I had a conversation and I said, hey, I think this project's relevant to you and your crew on the enterprise. I want you to add this channel to the enterprise. And maybe he screwed up and he added it to the wrong team. Well, if I flip over to back to Dwayne, who initiated the share of that channel, I can go into my activity feed and I get this indicator here that says that I have to approve Jean-Luc Picard's choice of where he dropped that shared channel. So you do have a opportunity here to say like maybe he maybe he accidentally shared it to like I said to the wrong team. I could decline his choice and he'd have to redo it. We'd have to go through that whole process again. So this is this is interesting. This isn't just like drag and drop you know there's a dance that has to happen here and anytime that you do this kind of thing we always say stop pump the brakes don't just share stuff to people communicate with them first again we go back to the purpose before people concept make sure that you've already sent a team's chat communicated to captain picard what you're doing why this project is relevant to his team where you know who are the members that we think should be working there and and have all that stuff lined up so that when you go through this process we don't have any accidents so i'm going to go ahead and accept captain jean-luc picard's uh choice to drop this into the uh enterprise channel so i will click prove now what do we have i've got an x project in Dwayne's test team. And if I flip over to Don Luke Picard's view, I've got NX project sitting inside of the Enterprise D channel uh, team. This is this is cool. We have had again, kind of like in the early days of Teams, we had people say, I want to add somebody to a channel without giving them access to everything. And you couldn't do it. And we would also have people say, well, if I can't do that, I want to have the same file in two places and keep it in sync. We're like, we can't do that either. <laughs> so you could share something through like OneDrive, maybe, uh, you know, you could technically share a file out from a team, but you couldn't really add the person to the team because, again, that would give them access to everything. And so this this is pretty wild here. This is index project. This is one singular shared channel that is being presented in multiple places at the same time with multiple different kinds of membership. Like, you know, what do we call it doing quantum mechanics? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like this is, this is, yeah, this is, this is something that exists in two places at once. Uh, you know, maybe this is, um, 
I don't know, a teleporter <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> so this is pretty cool. I, I I think there are some really interesting possibilities here. And, and one of the benefits that I want to say about this it, that I kind of glossed over early on is there's this phenomenon in teams known as teams sprawl. When an organization gets Microsoft Teams and people start to learn how to use it, they realize I need a team for you know, the football game. I need a team for, uh, you know, this pro NX project. I need a team for my county extension office. I need a team. For and all of a sudden you realize like, dang, I'm in a lot of teams. This is going to help reduce the number of teams that you have to be a member of. This is going to reduce the number of boxes that you have on your screen or the number of teams that are inside of your list. In my home environment, I mean, obviously, hopefully everybody realizes and sees that the Cloudy County team system is just for fun. You know, this is a, a test environment for Joe and I and a community for all of you. In my UF organization, I'm in like almost 200 teams. <laughs> it's it's half of them I've been added to to help somebody do something. But it's not great to look at your list of teams and have like, you know, overload. So having the ability to create a shared channel, drop it into another team means that's one less team that that entire group of people needs to be a member of. Uh, an example that we have that Joe's kind of got in the chat is, let's say your extension organization, you've got um, your dean of extension, and they want to be able to push out announcements to multiple places at the same time. In Florida, we've got those five district teams. We could create a announcements channel, drop it, share it from the Dean's team out to those five district teams. Now, when the Dean posts a newsletter or an announcement or uploads a file, it goes to all five of those places simultaneously. That means that the Dean doesn't have to be in their own extension admin team and be in all five district teams that's five that's five less teams that that, that dean has to be a member of that's probably going to make them happy <laughs> you know that that's that's probably going to increase the chances of success uh with them using teams now there is a limit to this joe what's the what's the max number of shared channels you can add to other teams the maximum uh sharing capability is out to 50 other teams. Um, so we initially thought, you know, maybe this would be something we could do, like you just said, uh, a dean of extension out to each of our county teams, because we do have a, a team for every county, uh, but we have more than 50 counties in the state of Florida. But at the district level, that could work. But yeah, so that's something to think about is you potentially architecting, um, you know, something intranetish around this capability um, to, to be aware of. Yeah, so I think Kevin's you create, comment you about 200, 200, I think, right? You, so you can create every channel, uh, the maximum, yeah. I think 200 could be a shared channel, but the sharing of it out to some other team is a limit of 50. Yeah. And again, uh, Ke Kevin has a comment in the chat about, you know, this really interesting architectural opportunities here for how you would build out internet and used a really great word there, planning. <laughs> you got to plan these. Uh, it could easily get pretty wild. Uh, and so, I, again, the key to all of that is going to be communication. Communicate what your intention is, what your audience is. Make sure something like this isn't already out there, you know, because you can't see other shared channels that you haven't been added to. You might not even know that they exist. Um, so I wanted to cover real quick the third option of NX project here, we are gonna share this out and I'm gonna share this with the team that I already own. Uh, this is very simple. This is basically the same process as what I just went through with sharing out to John Luke Picard and letting him choose a team. I'm just gonna basically share it with a team that I own already. So there's no need for me to go through uh, that entire like negotiation process. I just click share and click done. It says everybody has access to it and boom there it just popped up so th that right there is also super duper great uh i just can't i can't believe how long it took but 
I'm glad it's here. And I feel like this is, like I said early on, this is really going to change the way collaboration happens inside of an organization using Teams. And Joe, on our podcast, we talked about shared channels. And Joe made a really great point about now that shared channels are here, do you ever see a reason why we would ever create another private channel with the limitations that private channels have? I mean, I don't. I don't, I don't know, because when you go to NX project, check out what I can do. I could schedule a meeting here. <laughs> That's a huge one for me. Ch channel meetings, again, we haven't talked about meetings with this community yet, but channel meetings are an incredibly valuable and unique feature that only Microsoft Teams has, and we use them quite a bit. And I don't have that in a private channel, but I could do that in a shared channel. Now, unfortunately, we still don't have a planner, um, and I'm not I'm not too mad about that um, because you can use Microsoft Lists. Microsoft Lists is Joe like a spreadsheet on steroids. <laughs> yeah, a little a little cross before? between yeah a cross between maybe Excel and uh, anyone used Access. It's got a little bit of a database feel to it, um, but much simpler to use than something like like Microsoft Access. Yeah, and it's, and it's it Excel is, with lots of filtering capabilities. Yeah. Um, well, notifications. Top of it, workflow. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it is it is definitely possible to use Microsoft Lists to manage a small project. In fact, there's a ton of uh, templates here. So I just went in and added a list tab. Said I want to create a new list. You could start from scratch if you wanted to. Uh, but there's all kinds of, you know, um, little pre-made templates in here that you could use. So if I chose issue tracker, I get, you know, a view of what this list would look like. And I can use this template and kind of like refine it to make it my own. So you could manage a project. You even get a, there's a new board view. Um, I don't go too far in the list, but there's a board view that gives you that Kanban style of what planner offers where you have buckets that you can drop um items into a bucket to track it you could do the same thing uh with lists now so it's a workaround honestly but it's possible and so the two major things that you might be missing you get both of those with a shared channel and so i'm kind of i agree with joe like i don't really see a reason of why i would ever create a private channel and that reminds me earlier in in the meeting chat the a big thing came up they were asking about switching a channel from one type to another, and you cannot do that. You cannot take a, a standard channel and convert it to private. You cannot take a shared channel and convert it to standard or vice versa. So whenever you do this, again, that, that planning thing that came up earlier is super, super critical here because you have to make a decision from the get-go, from the inception of the, the uh, shared channel you have to make a decision is that should this be a shared channel or a private channel or a standard channel and so i think our advice for our users right now is uh once shared channels come out i would not see any reason to create a private channel going forward you get the same the same granular capability of adding specific people with the added benefit of they don't have to be a member of the team where the where the private channel is housed uh, and all the sharing capabilities to share with a, a completely different team. I think one of our scenarios for, for private channels has always been perhaps um, maybe it's a team for an extension office and there's a, a, a director um, and uh, some HR personnel and maybe they should have their own channel um, where that kind of data and communication is specific to just those couple people. Um, maybe even in this in that case where you right now initially you're thinking really it's just those two you know those two or three members of that team need access to that hr channel but what if maybe you want to bring in someone from the college level to help with some hr issues or something like that um where a shared channel if you started off with a shared channel you could do that even temporarily yeah. maybe bring someone in um, maybe you got somebody who's on going to be on leave for a while and you don't need to bring them to the entire team. You could bring in um, 
someone from we have a we have shared service centers at our university or maybe you bring in someone from another apartment that does hr work uh, temporarily so that definitely again like try to figure out why we still would do private channels probably something there but we're not not coming up with them yet. i have one i have one singular reason that um i will say uh as we move into our next use case of, of shared channels um the the marketing around shared channels you know is now I, and i bet i'm gonna go out on a limb here i'm gonna gamble a little bit uh, i'm gonna type in microsoft teams connect shared share whoops channels just see what comes up from microsoft um yeah so very very first point that they make about shared channels is the ability to seamlessly collaborate with external partners this is um not uh based in reality i would say when it comes to higher education so what mar the marketing says and this is we wanted to distill this and make this the real world use case of shared channels in our humble opinion is while microsoft says these are designed for seamlessly pulling in somebody from another organization into a channel that is true that is something that it can do but the political hurdles that you'll have to go through to make it happen i feel like make it really challenging in higher education there are some use cases in the private sector where it really makes a lot of sense but basically what is going on here is if i switch over to john luke picard you'll notice that he's in two different teams organizations he's been invited as a guest to another organization just like all of you have been invited as guests into the cloudy county team which by the way uh, i'll plug that real quick this is this is a place for you to ask questions all throughout the entire month the cloudy chat channel you know with working with john here on sharing with guests and stuff this is your opportunity to talk with everyone else that's a member of this community asynchronously throughout the month. Anyway, that's the that's the end of my plug. Um, <laughs> so if if John Luke Picard switches over to this other organization to see what's going on over there, you completely lose view of what's happening in your home organization. Great, I can see this stuff, but what happened to the to the enterprise channel, the enterprise team that I was in? I can't see it anymore. And so Microsoft is marketing shared channels with external collaborators as preventing you from having to do this part here this organization switcher uh which you know we've said before is a little clunky uh but it does work <laughs> so in a shared channel the idea is i could add a member to a channel from another institution and it would just show up on their list i have an example of that here so this is a, a friend of mine from Washington University. We went through all the necessary hoops to make his organization trust my organization. And he added me to a channel that's in a team inside of his institution. And I didn't have to switch like the guest thing. It just showed up. And that's pretty amazing. But again, there's a lot of hoops that have to be covered um, to make that work. <clears throat> there's a configuration that needs to be done by a IT administrator where you basically have to say, like, let's say the University of Florida wanted to work with the University of Georgia. The University of Florida would have to explicitly trust the University of Georgia and they would have to reciprocate. The University of Georgia would have to go into their system and trust the University of Florida. And once that had been done, you would be able to search and add people from Georgia into <clears throat> teams uh, and channels that are inside of the University of Florida. So it is possible, absolutely possible. Uh, one of the things that I see in private sector that is a no brainer here is mergers and acquisitions, like a company buys another company. Well, it's easier instead of trying to collapse everything that they're doing into your parent company, you can just establish that trust. And now those two companies members can work together really quickly. Uh, in higher education, it's not uncommon to have a, a state university system. Uh, I could see in a state system, a, a thing where some higher power says, 
thou shalt trust all other universities that are in the same system. And that would make it really easy to collaborate with other people who are members of universities in the same state. And then the last two examples that are kind of low hanging fruit is what if your university owns a hospital like we do in Florida? You know, the hospital has its own completely separate organization and we have to add people from the hospital as guests to teams inside the University of Florida. That can get a little weird. So if there was a trust established between the hospital's organization and the university's organization, that would make it a lot easier. And we have a situation in Florida with another school where all of their students were in a completely separate organization from the faculty and staff. That's not great. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not ideal. But you could use a shared channel. Like in that case, the same university owns and controls both team systems, they could decide we're going to set up this trust and now shared channels are going to make collaborating with students. There would be a lot less friction. Uh, so I think it will work. Uh, Joe has some big ideas around, you know, maybe Educause starting some sort of common consortium list kind of thing uh, where we talk, uh, you know, if you join Educause, you by default trust all these other organizations you know something like that would be really cool i'd like to see an index of some kind uh amongst research institutions or something like that yeah it'd be some type of clearinghouse edge at the edge of cause level or internet to level um maybe maybe all land grant maybe what is it usda that um owns and manages kind of uh, land grant extension programs perhaps but that's probably what uh, i think it would take I, I agree. Uh, I really, I really feel like though, don't get too um, worked up on shared channels as far as external use goes. Oh, oh gosh, before I forget, we've only got a couple minutes left. The the thing that I wanted to talk about with that real quick uh, is because shared channels were created to alleviate um, that whole guest thing that happens. You cannot add an external guest to a shared channel. Real bummer. Um, so if I go NX project, uh, share this channel with people. I saw Philip on the call. So if I type in his name, I can't get him in there. So that's a real bummer. Um, so that's one of the bigger limitations of a shared channel being used in this manner is it's really explicitly internal it is only for people who have accounts inside of your organization uh, a private channel you can add a guest to a private channel but remember that guest must be a member of the team that's how that's housing that private channel so we have had that situation come up too with conference planning and stuff like that you bring on a, a external collaborator who's a member of the conference planning committee and they're from you know, another university. Well, great, you can add them to that private channel, but now you've given them access to everything else that's in the entire team. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a tricky a tricky situation. But yeah, that is the one bigger limitation that I see of shared channels right now, and why you might still end up having to use a private channel. So it all comes down to planning, um, and you may have better luck asking your university to trust another university um i'm not so sure how <laughs> how how far we would get uh asking those questions here but uh it, there it's it's possible and uh i'm i'm really looking forward to the future of of um shared channels i think again i said this early on it's really going to change the way we collaborate in teams you get that granular control you get less teams you get the quantum theory physics of having a channel show up in multiple teams simultaneously. I think it's pretty incredible uh, and I'm, I'm excited. So everybody, you should see this again, Microsoft said mid July, uh, that's like right now. <laughs> so <laughs> a couple of days from now, uh, you should see this. It will be on by default from Microsoft. So if your tenants have your admins haven't changed anything, you'll just see it show up the next time you try to add a channel. Uh, so try adding a channel every couple of days and, and you should see it pop in. So like we say, always uh, recommend having a having a test team to go, you know, to go practice with this. Absolutely. Hopefully everybody has a test team. 
to to do to do these kinds of things in. Uh, it's your playground. Doesn't hurt. Doesn't cost any money. And uh, you can you can you know play around with stuff like this. So, well, it's it is uh, three o'clock on the dot. So I'm gonna go ahead and kill off the the recording. But we'll hang out on the call for about 20 minutes or so if there's any uh, more discussion or questions about this. Hopefully this inspires some conversation because, like I said, this is a pretty this is a pretty big deal in Teams land. Uh, so we'll we'll be on the call for a little while. And uh, if you're watching the recording, thank you so much for hanging out with us and we'll see you next month.